Welcome to the Air Combat Simulation Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Together with content creators, mission builders, experts, and enthusiasts, we explore the comprehensive world of combat aircraft simulation. everyone, welcome to episode 11 of the Air Combat Sim podcast. And today I have a great pleasure to welcome uh, two very special guests. Uh, so we'll be talking about the Raven 1 book and uh, campaign. So I'd like to welcome Kevin Miller, Hoser, who's the author of the book. Welcome, Hoser. Hello, BD. As well as Vince Naelo Jello, who's uh, also working on the campaign, and he's the host and the founder of the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Hi, Vincent. Hi, BD. Do I still count as a guest? Uh, <laughs> I think. <laughs> All right. Well, I've only been here twice, so I'll have to go a third time to be part of the show, I guess. Well, actually, uh, yeah, you're you're the host of the, our. It's not even a sister podcast. I'd say it's a our parent podcast. So, we have to, uh, a godfather. <laughs> Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Rob, uh, so Goat, who is our well co-host and panel member. Hi, Rob. Rob. Hey, how's it going? So as we're nearing to the completion and release of the Raven 1 campaign, we thought it would be nice to get together and discuss the whole process of making it, the background and uh, how to look. Uh, so here we are. Uh, Rob? Do you think what, what, what should we kick off with? I think it'd be great. Um, and while I certainly have read um, Hoser's books um, more than once or listened to him as well, um, it'd be great. Um, Hoser, if you could go and give us an overview of the books, and I would really, uh, well, actually, before we do that, can you give us a little bit of your background? Tell us about you. Sure. I was a Navy carrier pilot in the 80s and 90s. In the in the mid-80s, I flew the A-7 Corsair II, uh, two deployments aboard USS Nimitz, uh, med deployments. And then the transition to the F-A-18, I instructed in the Hornet. And uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, three deployments, all to uh, the Persian Gulf and Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, um, and about the 2,000 hours uh, in the airplane. Um, but uh, all roads lead to the Pentagon, and, uh, and my, my flying days were over. So a couple of tours in the Pentagon in the early 2000s, and I retired in 2005. Gotcha. And what what was it? Had you always thought about writing uh, books, or what got you motivated and started going down that road? When I retired, my friend Dave Wooten said, you know, you should write a book. And I, I kind of waved him off, oh, get out. You know, and and I think it, it's it's the um, true of all of us who, uh, who who are aviators. People say, "Oh, you must have a lot of stories." And, and yeah, sure, we, we have some stories, but you know, we, we can look back at our ancestors. You know, those guys had stories. But my friend pressed me, said, "No, no, no, you got stories. You should write a book." And so I thought, you know what? I'll, I'll, maybe I should. And and uh, yeah, it, it'll be something for the kids. You know, they they can read years later, see what what their dad did. And so I. I wrote the book in fits and starts. I'd put it away for months and pick it back up. But by the end of 2009, I was wrapping it up and I knew that I really had something. And uh, so it was a uh, um, another story on how I got it published. But uh, Raven One was published in uh, June of 14, six years now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, uh, it resonated with readers right from the get-go and has, has been doing great ever since. And you actually have had um, two follow-ups to that original book from the Raven One series. And then you've got your most recent book that you just released, uh, I guess, about a month ago? Yes. Uh, when I published Raven One, you know, it's like, uh, wow, I've, I've, I've finished a marathon, published a book. And my uh, my editor said, okay, now you, get, you know, you've just signed yourself up. For, uh, for a job of writing novels, you, so I wrote uh, 
declared hostile uh, two years later, and I took Flip and and uh, and Olive and Weed, and I promoted them, and we went to the Caribbean, explored that part of the world, and then two years ago with Fight Fight, uh, what's going on uh, in the South China Sea? Uh, much of it resonates with what we see in the news today. And uh, uh, but yes, just uh, just two weeks ago, I published the Silver Waterfall, and this is a book that I had, I had always wanted to write. And I think I published it at the right time. And this is historic fiction about the Battle of Midway. And, you know, we know how the Battle of Midway ends and much has been written on it. And it's it's all good, the narrative nonfiction. But this is a historical fiction account, uh, just like Michael Shara did with uh, the Battle of Gettysburg, you know, putting you there and, and giving voice and heart and emotion to the combatants on both sides. And it's a, certainly a new way to look at the battle. Yes, it's been uh, it's been out now uh, in in uh, digital and print format for a couple of weeks. Uh, just wrapping up the audio book. I listened to the final chapter today. We should have the audio book published uh, within 10 days. Oh, wow. Okay, great. That, that actually, um, <clears throat> with two small six-year-olds, audio books are... Uh, my uh, that was my go to uh format these days, <laughs> yeah. Same here. So. Hey, go. Can I just add that uh, the, the characters that Hoser mentioned there, Flip and Olive and Weed, they're they're the ones you 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 ride along with through these series of books. And on Raven One, I lived the life, I mean, I didn't do everything that Hoser so expertly puts in these books, but the naval aviation scenes, the liberty scenes in port, the drama, the good characters and the bad characters, it's, I, I enjoyed it immensely having lived this life myself and, and you get to know these characters and to watch them develop through this series is just as enjoyable as any of the, whatever other people enjoy, whether it's Indiana Jones or Star Wars or other characters that you get to know. Uh, I really found, even though I'd lived a lot of it, that I, I could relate and just really enjoyed the series myself. That's why it was so great, great for me to be a part of this project. Well, in, in sort of talk a little bit about uh, the project, I know that uh, BVR Productions, uh, the idea started floating around at some point uh, that, and I, yeah, and I would just say that, um, my comment to the team has been that I think, uh, it's been a phenomenal journey. Uh, and it couldn't have been a better match in terms of, uh, putting BD together with both, you know, Hoser and Ujello that, you know, it's been, uh, from me on the sidelines and watching the emails and the documents fly back and forth, it's actually been incredible. Um, and, and so for, as we approach, I guess we're about, a little less than a month away. Is that all right, BD? Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> well, there are things we can't control, indeed. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that our objective was, uh, you know, certainly one of the challenges with uh, DCS as a game is that it uh, doesn't always, you know, you can certainly get some missions and in, in campaigns and getting a narrative to follow through. So that's one of the reasons when we started talking about it, BD was probably the most highly recommended person that um, uh, that the Eagle Dynamics team came back with. And so we were really excited uh, when we started having conversations and then it all came together. BD, how did you feel when we start, first started talking about uh, uh, the idea of the concept? I mean, for me, it was incredible because... Uh, I remember I when I, I was listening to the podcast and I had probably 15 or 20 episodes that I didn't hear. So I had a long, every day when I was commuting to work, I would listen to one episode. And I thought, well, uh, maybe I'll get in touch. I first th thought was maybe maybe I'll just become a supporter in Patreon just because it's so cool. And I thought maybe, maybe there's a way to do something together. Uh, I wasn't thinking about a campaign at all. But I, I wrote, I remember I wrote to Jello and then he wrote back and then he called me soon after saying well let's do together let's do a campaign together and i was like yeah my, my dream just came true from my point of view uh and i'm i had no military or not to mention aviation history or or experience before i just learned everything from scratch uh, while doing these campaigns and being able to do one with two experienced aviators uh, and based on an excellent book that was just 
amazing and and that indeed was an amazing uh, experience and good fun uh, all along so so yeah i was i was super excited uh when 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 the proposition came through and uh yeah, i should probably ask my wife because i was almost jumping up and down like a kid <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I can take credit for the idea. I don't remember it being my idea. I was just learning about DCS at the time myself. So go, I got to think this was your idea. Um, yeah, I, it, it, I remember. Yeah, it was, but I, you know, <laughs> it takes a team. Come on. I haven't, I have a million ideas, but getting them executed. But I thought, I remember standing there and I was listening. I think it was to uh, Raven one, probably for the third time. And I'm sitting there going, wow, I wonder if you could take a DCS campaign and tie it in with this. And I told my wife, and of course, she she was so excited. Um, <laughs> no, not, not really. And, uh, but, um, but, you know, it was sort of, you know, it was a, to me, it was a, it seemed like a really interesting opportunity. And, um, and so that's, you know, that's when we, you know, started throwing the idea out to the team and, and, uh, and started going down this road. Yeah. Well, it was fortuitous that Hoser and I immediately struck up a friendship, even though we've probably been in many of the same places, possibly at the same time. I don't think we knew each other until he reached out when the Fighter Pilot Podcast first launched. And we had him on the show, episode 20, back in February of 18. And it's been great knowing him ever since and run a lot of the same circles and a lot of the same experiences. He was just a, a little ahead of me. And by the way, to your point, Hoser, about all roads lead to the Pentagon, I suppose that's why you retired as a captain and me only a lowly commander because I, I never did a tour there. Uh, Congratulations. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but at any rate, no, I just remember broaching it with him and he thought it was a great idea. Uh, and so it was it was a lot more work. And it took a lot longer than I expected. And that's really a dumb thing for me to say because I didn't barely do any of the work. So I think we should let BD talk about the process of building this campaign because he would come back every so often and say, hey, Hoser and Jello, what do you guys think? And it was just a really interesting process and working with him through the iterations of, okay, well, is this going to be more realistic or is it going to be more fun for the player? And we'd really tried to strike that balance all throughout the process, I thought. Yeah, I think the first first part was to come up with the whole series of missions because obviously we would take those who are, which were in the book, uh, and there are probably five or six of those, including the one with uh, USS Richard Best, which is kind of well, it, it, it's it's showing what happened in the book, but we we insert a player into Hornets into the whole situation to make it more interesting. Uh, but so we uh, we were talking about each mission, uh, putting them chron- chronologically, and then trying to fill in the the gaps between those that were described in the book. Um, and we ended, I think, because the, the real action starts probably with with uh, the prince, charming, and so we have five missions or four missions before that that are not strictly. Um, not strictly, say combat missions. So we tried to make it interesting uh, without firing a shot. And I think one of them uh, that Red Kite recently previewed is, is one of them. It's, it's just this surface scan mission where uh, supposedly nothing is happening. And to the point of Hoser about the uh, f- um, fight, fight, and and the current situation in the China Sea. Uh, actually, this one is also describing what was then at the time of writing happening in, in the Strait of Hormuz and the Persian Gulf when the Iranians would uh, stop uh, the British tankers and some other t- traffic. Um, so we tried to kind of blend it nicely into the campaign too. Um, and also shows how Raven 1 is, uh, as a book is also uh, on like very current today with what's happening. But anyway, so we came up with 15 missions in total. Uh, and and then we... I. I after writing the general overview, I, I would send them to Kevin and to Vincent and to see what would their feedback be. And we changed some of them completely. With some, we just went along. Um, so that was the first part, I think. What were some of the limitations that you had based on DCS in terms of matching it with uh, the books? There was, I wasn't really sure at the beginning because I, I wasn't sure if we were able to recreate some of the missions uh, as described in the book. And the end of the day, now I see it's it was it wasn't easy, but it was all doable. Almost everything could be done and was done, and the the effect, at least from my point of view, uh, 
and I've been playing playing each of these missions a few times or more. Now uh, they play very well, uh, but of course there are some limitations, and um, some of them are with what we have available. What we have available in in DCS, so types of airplane, types of uh, ground troops or units or surface units. So we'd have to substitute some of them. Uh, we don't have, for instance, the intruders, which are in the book. So we had to, we had to substitute them with, with the Vikings, at least for the time being, because we hear that these units are going to get the A6s later on. And we don't have Super Hornets. So that kind of thing was one of the blo- problems, but not stopping blocks, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. From my, um, you know, from what I've done in terms of some of the missions that I've I've flown, I've been extremely impressed, and I think that it it is very true to the book, uh, and certainly I think the cast members or the voice folks that have gotten in there have done an amazing job. You know, guys, I want to add here that uh, it was about three years ago that I became aware of DCS. And the way I became aware of them is the reviews that Raven One was getting from from these guys that that were talking about DCS. Like, you know, any any DCSer would love this. What is that? And 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 these reviews come from not only the U.S. but uh, but also UK, Australia, Canada, um, and and elsewhere. And uh, so I I. I had a sense that okay, there, there, there's these gamers out there, and and they like the detail that they see in Raven One. Raven One, uh, you, you you love the detail, or you don't like it so much. I mean, uh, the reader has to kind of hang on. I mean, you you're you're immersed, and you're you're getting detail, and uh, and you find out that the the DCSers love it, and 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 want more of it. And it was yes, uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was interesting working with uh, with BD. Uh, as as we approach these, uh, you know, the, the amount of detail we're going to put in this. Now, have you ever had a chance to? I'm, I'm sure you've seen it online, but have you ever had a chance to play DCS? Yeah, I just did uh, about ten days ago. A, a friend of mine, uh, Butch Kissick, owns a owns a business here in Pensacola, uh, and uh, and and he has a DCS cockpit in, in his in his shop, and and. Uh, Oh yeah, he he's all over it. He he can't wait for the Raven One game, and uh, he's going to invite me over and we'll play it. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic! So, what did you? What was your experience with DCS? Did you fly the eighteen, the F eighteen? Yes. Uh huh. And, off, and off the ship, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, I and I'm always curious because I think, um, and certainly, you know, um, when we talk about uh, DCS. We had the first, uh, I guess, our initial episode with um, with Jello, and we were talking about um, some of the simisms. And uh, you know, all things considered, I think back to um, you know, we know it's not just like it, but I, when I compare and contrast back to the simulators of the '90s or the '80s, and they certainly have come a long way in terms of what can be uh, the experience it can provide. And there certainly is a number of folks that are out there today that you know never going to have the chance or for whatever reason to be a naval aviator and this uh, certainly gets them a step closer uh, but you know uh, from a game standpoint I think you know we've we've done a really interesting job of trying to bring the world that you both have lived I think closer uh, to reality and I think as as Jello said getting to read or listen to the book and then getting to match up with a um, those pieces uh, within the within the game has been uh, just pretty neat. Yeah, no doubt. I, I think it's a very natural match. I remember listening to the book. Uh, I think the chapter with SpongeBob, and and when uh, Hoser described step after step all the landing procedures or before landing checklists, etc. And I, I was able to, of course, visualize them because knowing them from DCS and and exactly do them exactly in the same order as described in the book. So it's 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 a very natural match between the two. And it, it shows in the campaign in, in really many, uh, many moments. And also, a uh, great thing is that the F-18 in DCS, it's really evolving. So once recently we got the ground radar, it completely changed some of the missions, which when we built them or wrote them, we didn't have the ground radar, just hoping it will arrive at some point and it fit in perfectly well. And there are lots of examples like that. 
Can you talk a little bit about Supercarrier? Uh, I know that at one point there was a call that was made and said, hey, we really want to make this as uh, realistic or, or true to the uh, true to the uh, book. And so it is, uh, we had a delay. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Um, the supercarrier, it just adds a new, whole new level level of immersion and realism. Because what it does is, A, it allows to launch big packages from the deck without having to spawn anything in the air or on, even on the on the cat. Uh, so something that would not, would not be possible with the stock carrier. Maybe it changed now, but uh, it wasn't possible before. So for Bandar Abba Strike, where we have, I think, 16 planes taking off, they all start... Uh, cold on the on the deck and then take off in order and then marshal to go to the martial area it's it's really incredible even the feeling of being part of such a big thing but it's a big mission for dcs standards um and also the the deck crew uh, it's just amazing it adds a complete new layer of of of, of playing of utility and of realism cool i was very gratified cool. to hear that uh, uh super carrier was available bd explained it um, what what it brought to the table for this game and and uh, you know we were talking about realism before uh, this in, in the graphics and and the realism it, it looks like a a color photograph uh, you know it, it images I I've, I've actually uh, lived of course and uh, so I, I think it's really going to be a lot of fun for uh, for for the serious gamer I mean this it, it's it, just amazing realism. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you bring that up. And you and I were talking about it a bit earlier in that for those folks that aren't familiar with DCS and that hear this through the Fighter Pilot podcast stream, as BD mentioned, the immersion of being able to go sitting into this in this cockpit and actually having to hit the, the right buttons in the right sequence to get the aircraft going. Or is it certainly a different uh, level of... Uh, of knowledge that you have to learn on how to do these things. So, um, and I was commenting uh, that, you know, it certainly is going to take an awful long time to learn just one aircraft and there's so many to learn. But um, Hoser, you asked me a question uh, last week and I, it was funny. I was reflecting on it a little bit later. You said, are you a gamer? And I said, and I was thinking, um, I'm, I don't think gamers would think that I'm necessarily a gamer, but, I have I get a lot of enjoyment out of this product, and having read the book, uh, it's just been a, a really going through the missions has been a great experience. I, what I've learned about this um, this community of people, uh, you know, playing these serious games, uh, they they want to fly these aircraft the right way. They. Um, what I what I can glean is that you know you just don't want to you know get in the cockpit and okay I got belt fed missiles and I got unlimited fuel we're just going to go rage around and shoot everything and isn't that fun and but but uh, the, the the players they they want to fly precisely they're going to manage their fuel they're going to manage their weapons uh, they're going to uh, manage where they are with their navigation and not stray into restricted airspace and all, all the all the real life constraints. That, uh, that that today's carrier aviators live with, and and you know, in in a way, this is this is logistics, but but it's the management of, of these logistics that and, and doing it well. You can come back, hey, you know, we, we flew that very well, and that and that's, uh, you know, even when I was uh, flying and, and Joe was flying, you come back from a flight, and you know you, that that you flew just the way you briefed it, that that passes for fun. Oh, yeah. And if if you're ashore, you can go. Uh, you can go to the club. If you're if you're deployed, well, that, that's for another time. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, this is what you said about this. Um, just going all those real life constraints. This is what I use as a, or I hope that players will will exhibit because uh, some of the things in the campaign are based on where the player is. So if he follows the flight plan that he has in his flight in his nav computer then everything will be fine but if he decides to go some different way uh, then the mission will not work but fortunately most of the dcs players are mature enough to, to yeah just do what they're told as people are in the military normally yeah and one thing you i i'm, I'm wondering and i 
do believe that you did include some air to air refueling, haven't you? Uh, there are a very few missions where there's no uh, air to air refueling. Uh, oh, this is one of those things when we have to probably find a striker's fine balance between realism and fun. Because there are some people who hate it and who will never learn to, how to do it, but still would like to play this um, campaign. So I'm thinking about a few ways out for them. And mo most of the missions, uh, you if you manage your fuel properly, you will be able to land and not have to refuel. In some others, if you run out of fuel, you can go to the alternate airport, and then in the next mission, we just have to fly back to the carrier. And in those where you really need to refuel, like the one uh, with um, Bowser in, in Basra, then I'll probably build in a way out so you can press a button when you're behind the tanker and then f finish the mission and the next episode will start after you've refueled. Although I, I, I hope most of the people will just refuel because it's more fun to fly a whole two-hour two mission than uh, split it into smaller parts. No, that's great. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to be very interested to see how uh, a, a lot of people will, will go after that. I know that, you know, that is one of those skills that um, people certainly want to get the realism. Boy, that's one of those ones that people have a hard time. How did this, you know, BD, how did this compare to some of the other campaigns that you've developed? Mm, well, first of all, um, each script of the mission, I have like 40 to 60 different comments, which normally I wouldn't get. And that was good fun because I learned a lot. Uh, well, I, I was preparing the first script where with all the voiceovers or lines for each character would send it then to Jello and Hoser. And I'll get back lots of comments or changes or proposal for changes. And in the end, each script changed quite a lot, which is good because, uh, well, because that way it, it, it became much more realistic. Some parts I think I learned and, and started to do right. Some others I couldn't, like the uh, terminolo terminology for the AWEX, which I always did something wrong, right, Joe? <laughs> you got better. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I just couldn't nail it, but yeah, but it is incredible uh, to to. So th that's one big difference. Definitely, this will be the most realistic campaign when it comes to comms and and brevity. And although probably it's still not as realistic as it could be, because if it were, we would have half of the uh, lines less, because most of the things would be done with hand signals or some other way of communicating and uh, not, co not not necessarily on the radio but this has has its limitations and also sometimes i feel i need to guide the players by hand a little bit and there's no better way to do it than via radio comms so i think that was one of those um, middle grounds that we agreed on while while doing that and another thing that's completely different is the way for the ai uh, wingman because i don't use the stock AI wingman from DCS where you have a special radio menu where you can give them tens of comments which nobody ever uses probably like changing formations and attacking targets which usually don't really work that well. So I'm using um, other AI flights that would follow the player and player can give them orders using the F10 radio menu. So it limits the option but again I think it's quite realistic because uh, it's usually it's a, it's a question whether you attack target or your wingman attacks target, and then uh, you would have to do it anyway, in the way that it's told to him or you by the JTAC or whoever else. So it's um, it it plays pretty well in the end because it also doesn't break the immersion that much because uh, the stock wingman use specific voiceovers that you can hear that are um, stitched together from, from different parts of sentences and have different voice than the actor that's playing given wingman. And now we can avoid that and have one voice uh, consistently throughout the whole mission for, for each given uh, pilot. How was the creation for you, the process? It's on one hand uh, it's great fun. On the other, you know, it's lots of things with the DCS AI. It was extremely frustrating because sometimes it took hours to just make them do one thing right. So I wanted them to attack this target from this angle and from using this weapon, and they wouldn't do it. So I had to, to change different parameters and really work hard to make it happen. But it did. Now I think most of what I've seen works as I wanted it to work. So uh, having that out of the way, uh, it, it was good fun. 
I was very surprised on the number of QA folks that you have lined up. And so that was a really interesting thing uh, for me to watch uh, from the sidelines. And uh, thank you for inviting me. And then I had a few comments that I think were quickly resolved or had been resolved by the time I reported them. So I didn't feel like I did a very thorough job. Um, but, um, you know, it was really interesting to watch the number of people that you had lined up to to actually go through all the missions and to provide feedback. And, you know, I work at a, a, a software company, so I'm very familiar with uh, the process. And hands down, uh, you know, it was really impressive how you guys were putting it together. Well, the beta testers are great folks, and uh, I usually work with them, the same team. And it takes a lot, uh, really a lot of resolve to play the same mission for the 25th time. Uh, because even if they're really nice to play, at some point it can get boring and repetitive. And just doing that or or, or even specifically playing complete dump to just try to break it somewhere and see if it's if it's resistant to that or not also takes some um, take some courage or, or maybe not courage, but uh, dedication. So, yeah, I, I really would like to t- thank them because I feel it will be a very solid product once we release it with hopefully without too many bugs or problems. So, um, Hoser, so I was curious for you, was it very, how, how did you feel about the process as the emails and the scripts came and went back and forth? I was impressed right away by BD's level of knowledge of military aviation and carrier aviation. And the, uh, the, uh, what, what we would get is a spreadsheet. And had the spreadsheet of, uh, of of who says what when, and the controlling agencies. And wow, this is this is amazing. So I'd kind of go through it as as, as Jello would too. Uh, yes, yes, okay. This can be changed a little bit. This is kind of how we would do it. And then during the process, uh, I I learned you know what what was uh, you know what what was doable in in simulation. And and you know BD hit on it. I mean you know. Uh, in-flight refueling. In the daytime, it's all hand signals around the ship as we refuel each other with the, the, the probe and drogue method. Um, but in, in gameplay, that's that's not going to happen. You're going to have a big wing tanker and, and, it's, and it's much more structured. I get it. And, and so, uh, but, but it, was, it was just a, uh, a fun process and I, I looked forward to, to getting the missions and, and uh, for, for me, <laughs> I'm sure Jello as well, you know, we we can go back to uh, back to our to our flying days and, and re- relive some of that stuff. I also felt that the game and BD uh, kept it very close to the book and, and respected the book, and uh, that's that's uh, very gratifying for me. Hey, Goat, if I could add to that, for me it was tough because I was a little bit stuck in the middle, having never done this before wanting to be true to the book, which I agree that we did a good job of, but also wanting to extend kind of the MO of the fighter pilot podcast, if you will, which is to educate and entertain. And so we tried, I think, to make everything as accurate as possible. And the interesting conundrum of that is that even at Top Gun, you might go out on a course and you have the things to say and do, but you never do them perfectly by the book. And when you come back, of course, you spend hours debriefing them. But when you have the ability to put it in the script, you could make it picture perfect. And so I was always torn with, okay, do we want it to be perfect? But that's unrealistic because in real life, it wouldn't be perfect, especially when bullets start flying. And so we had to, I think, give and take a little bit. In the end, it was just great working with everybody because the chemistry was there. And I think we really struck a good balance of this is what, it would really look like and feel like, because I think the players of this are going to be interested in it, right? This isn't just a pull up at the arcade and throw a quarter in and, and get a quick thrill. This is a dedicated effort for folks who want to play this and, and be immersed in it. And so we wanted to, to find that balance. And I, I think we did. Concur. Yeah, that's some really, that's some, that's some good feedback. And as I mentioned, uh, I got to see things go back and forth and uh, I think a lot of discussion about in hot, uh, I should have, <laughs> should, we should not be used, but, um, uh, it, no, it, to me, it was, like I said, I'm, uh, on the side, it was a, it was very cool to sit there and see, uh, the exchange go back and forth. Um, hey BD, so 
in addition to the QA team, can you talk a little bit about the different folks that were involved in the development of the campaign? Yeah, sure. So uh, obviously the, the biggest biggest part uh, to do was, was the voiceovers. And here uh, a big shout out to uh, Bel who who did a great job um, uh, impersonating Flip. I actually tried to invite him today to join us, but but he couldn't as he's working. Uh, but he, he did an amazing job. Uh, his voice is pretty well known, at least in the community. And when I was reading the book, I, I and reading or actually listening to the book mostly, uh, when, whenever Flip was talking, I already heard uh, his voice. So I was mm-hmm. super happy that he agreed to do it. And it's a huge job because he had to... I, I don't actually, actually quickly check, but I think it's it's... it's around thousands or so lines for for him only to record for the whole campaign so it's a lot uh, of work but then i also am happy that that we managed to get uh, i think all of the pretty well known youtubers and community members for dcs uh, so we had uh, we had tricker we had jabbers we had uh, a growing side window we had spudnucker um, uh, lots of folks that that usually work with us uh, or with me before to in total, I don't remember now, but it's around fifty or sixty people that were involved at some stage uh, with recording the vo- their voices for for the uh, for the characters, oh, uh, and of course uh, Ralphie did as well as Saint. And again, I think he did a really good job uh, impersonating him. That's great. Yeah, and and then again, what we're still working on right now, which has been terrific has been a lot of the um a lot of the creative uh, at least in terms of the designs so paolo we definitely need to make sure that we uh, he's been doing a phenomenal job on the skins and the designs yeah the campaign will feature a whole new set of skins for all the squadrons that were in the book uh and so we'll have those and we'll also have patches and merchandise and i think that jello could tell us a little bit more about that but uh, mike is also doing a a lot of great projects for 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 squadron patches. Oh yeah, we have uh, Mike Valencourt, who was as many of the other folks who help out the shows are volunteers that just come up and say, "Hey, I like what you guys are doing. I want to help out." And so we are in the midst of that process right now, trying to finalize some merchandise. And it's kind of fun because I was a part of a squadron, and Hoser, I bet you were too, where. Early on, of course, now everything's on the internet, but early on, you just, hey, we want a squadron t-shirt. Okay, who knows how to draw? Oh, I do. Okay, come up with a design, put it on a shirt, and let's go. And you can tell it's somewhat amateur. So w- we we have the idea that we want to make this notional squadron airwing all these folks from the book, but make real life t-shirts and you know patches and different things and so when you see them we can't make them look too good a lot like the comms we were talking about before because then it wouldn't look as realistic so we've got some ideas for some merchandise and we're going to release those with the dcs campaign on a limited time basis and if folks see each other at an air show someday when air shows are allowed again and you see vfa 64 or one of the other squadrons you can kind of do a wink or a nod and and know that that's from the notional air wing from Raven one and, and it'll be like an inside club. I hope. Yeah, that's really, I think that's, it's, it's really neat to see how it's all coming together. Um, and, and, and just because I don't know, um, so Hoser, why did you, uh, are you not allowed to use real squadrons when you're developing the book or how do you decide whether to use fictional ones? Yeah. G- great question. Uh, I, I decided to make, fictional squadrons and, and fictional ships and in most cases some are real but, but uh you know uss valley forge uh is, is not a uh, is not a, a nimbus class carrier in commission uh but but there was a valley forge in uh, uh aircraft carrier uh, back during the korean war um and and it makes it easier i think uh, because people say well you know like let, let's say i'd use uss nimbus in in my in my novel and, and talked about it, and someone could have said, well, Nimitz wasn't there, or Nimitz was in the yards, or, or this or that, or you, you know. And, and so, I think, sorry, I think Nimitz went back to Pearl Harbor, didn't it? That's right, or yeah. It, it was in a time warp, yeah, that, that's, that's been done already. Uh, so uh, picking out the, the names of, of uh, you know, making the names of these squadrons and, and, uh, and carriers, uh, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun, and, and it has been fun, you know, with, with all of us. You know, looking at these, uh, at the 
the, the squadron designs and coming up with designs, uh, you know, for, for the merchandise campaign. That, that's again, that, that's realistic. That yeah, I I could I can can see a squadron, a fictional squadron with this patch. Yeah, that that that, that tells what they do. So uh, anyway, that's that's my, my long winded answer on just you know making it up fictionally for a novel is works for me. No, it's interesting, and and just as an idea, we were talking. I was uh, in a conversation with uh, with Jello yesterday, and we were talking, and we were floating the thread that. Um, It'd be great to have a final countdown um, campaign, but now since uh, the folks at Eagle Dynamics have developed a, uh, a uh, what is it? The new uh, can they have a new map that's for World War II. So maybe uh, maybe maybe there's a European World War II campaign where you guys could team up and have the have the Valley Forge go back and take on the Third Reich. That would be interesting, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're both shaking their head no. <laughs> I say we do it. I think it would be pretty interesting to see uh, because there's, you know, that's one of the things that um, Eagle Dynamics is doing is investing an awful lot on in the World War II theme as well. So you certainly have an entire audience that it gravitates towards it. So if that is an interesting, I think it's nothing quite like that F-14s in uh, the final countdown, um, that scene where they're actually with the um, uh, the zeros. So uh, I think there's something there, but we'll see. Yeah, honestly, I think... I've got a novel for it ready to go. <laughs> Sending it back to Midway? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's another one. They take it to the... You've already, yeah, you've got Midway. Yeah, sure. Part of what we want to do is talk about, you know, as we think about the release plan and the next days coming up, BD, can you talk a little bit about what the rollout plan is going to look like and how it'll be released by Eagle Dynamics and what our expectations are? Uh, well, I, I can talk about specific dates because it all depends on many factors. Mm -hmm. uh, so once I have it wrapped up and ready to send to them, which I hope I will in the next two to three weeks, which includes uh, not only all the missions tested and ready, all the skins, uh, the trailer, screenshots, uh, description, or lots of stuff that still needs to be done, although it should be pretty easy. And then they usually should be able to do it, to, to prepare it for release within two weeks. But it all depends on the other things that are on the pipeline and how the open beta looks, if there are no groundbreaking bugs or something like that. So we may plan and do our best for some date, but it, it's not granted that it will happen. But yeah, we're in the final stage, so I'm waiting for some final voiceovers. I'm working on the trailer, uh, and then we're doing lots of bug squashing and, and final testing of the mission so they uh, work well out of the box. And, uh, and yeah, I hope in two, two and a half weeks to have that all done and then sent to Ed. And then it's up to them basically when it's uh, going to be released. We have a couple more videos that are being worked on. Yeah, we sent, uh, I sent missions to Ralphie Dude, to Tricker, to Spudnocker, and to and someone else. Uh, but basically, yeah, there'll be a few more missions that should be featured. I also sent a few missions to massbike.com because they usually it's a, it's a website with uh, reviews of different campaigns and different models. So they usually review the campaigns I make and write articles about them for those who don't want to watch the videos or some don't want to do it, not to spoil, spoil the fun uh, for themselves. So I think that's also, uh, there'll be much more Raven 1 content coming out soon before release. Well, and I, I'd say now is a perfect time. If you haven't read Raven one, now is a great time. You've got plenty, you've got just enough time to get that book and uh, read it and be ready for the campaign when it comes out. And that's an interesting question actually, because lots of people ask me whether they should read the book before playing or they should read the book after playing the campaign. And I had a tough time answering that because obviously there'll be some spoilers, but if you read the book, uh, you know or you can feel the characters much better and, and understand them much better if you play the campaign afterwards. On the other hand, if you first play the campaign, then probably reading the book, you'll you'll kind of have some, those oh moments where you think about those characters and what they did in the campaign. I don't know, Jose, what do you think about it? 
an interesting question. Um, I, I guess um, um, maybe I, I come down on, on, on reading first, and, uh, and then you have some, uh, some, some background on the characters. I, I, but I, I had not thought of it uh, the other way. I agree or, with Hoser if I can jump in. Um, however, I think if you're the kind of person that doesn't want to know what's coming and you just want to go do it, then maybe you could do the campaign – and then read the book and then do it again, because I bet you would get more out of it after reading and getting to know the characters than just doing it the first time. So for those who and it's 15 missions, right, BD? So you're probably not going to remember every single one of them by the time you read the book, uh, you know, a couple of weeks, depending on how quickly you read and go to do it again. So for those who want to be surprised, maybe you do it and then read it and then do it again. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think we were trying, I mean, writing the briefings or writing the missions, trying to keep the characters real to, to their um, b- uh, original, I know, uh, role models from, from the book, or uh, you know, if I say it correctly. But uh, and, and I'm very grateful to Jose because I, I did what I could, but then he would jump in and really fine-tune all the details so, so they would be really consistent with, with how they were portrayed in the book. I, I agree, BD. You you uh, you captured the, the the character of of the characters, and uh, and and uh, and wrote this uh, very true to, uh, to to their personalities and, and what they would say on the radio. Um, I, I think that uh, that those that have read the novel are, are going to recognize some of them right away. But and also thanks to the fact that the the characters were so well uh, portrayed or, or devised. That they, they really each of them was different and it was really easy to grasp the, the personality. Like Saint, I love Saint, and I really <laughs> put in quite a few missions because of that. It's it's just good fun to have, uh, probably in the book uh, or in the game, not in real life, I guess. Sure, that's right. Uh, I'll I'll I'll, uh, I'll talk about Saint right now. People have asked me over the years um, who I modeled Saint on. And uh, my honest answer is I never serve with a guy as bad as Saint. So <laughs> there, there's the answer to that. It's more of a uh, aggregation of all of the ter- of, the, of all the people that you work with that would sort of be in you his. No, just the, you know human qualities and, and not no. not the best uh, human qualities all wrapped up in, into one character. Well, and that's an interesting point because from the outsiders, I bet people think of most fighter pilots as. Well, frankly, what you are fed by social media and Hollywood. And for for the most part, except for the outrageous egos, I would say that's pretty close. People who are affable, agreeable, able to get things done, work well in teams, blah, blah, blah. But it's curious. Every once in a while, you just get someone like Saint and you just scratch your head. How do they find their way into these positions of leadership and how do they get this far? And, And it's just unfortunate because it makes everyone's life miserable so i can imagine hoser that there were some friends maybe out there that were a little nervous that maybe you modeled it after them or whatever but but yeah he he is the worst of several leaders i think we've all served with folks that have some of his traits but thankfully not all of them exactly i you know sometimes guys would come up to me all right hoser you can tell me who was that and it's, no, no. <laughs> it uh it's it, it's uh it, it's nobody um but yeah, you're, you're right, Jello. I mean, yeah, we're we're uh, you know pretty pretty much basic men, um, and we, we got to do a pretty cool job uh, at, at one point in our lives. Uh, but you, you'll just uh, once in a while you'll there's there's one you might run across that's uh, that's not like the others. Yes. Mm-hmm. What about the other characters? Were they all different? Agri- were there other ones anchors on some folks that you knew closer than uh, just Saint? You know, that, that's a fair question. I think that uh, um, the, the general answer is yes. You, you, people that, that you've served with over the years and, um, you know, there's uh, every squadron has uh, a, a, a guy, you know, quick with wisecracks. Uh, so, some are, are more reserved. Some are, are wild and crazy party people. Sure, you, you're, you're going to find that. Um, I, I talk about that in Raven One early on. Just the, the, the ethos of Squadron Life chapters, a little chapter, just kind of give you a, a background of, of what it's like. Everyone wants to be number one at all times, and that's impossible. You know, you just you just can't do it. So, but the fact that we uh, compete in every area uh, allows everyone to to be number one in something. So, what's uh, what's next for uh, for Flip? 
Is there a, another adventure for Flip on the horizon? Flip is on shore, shore duty right now, probably in the Pentagon, uh, you know, uh, paying his, his, his penance before he can go to sea again. He'll be so thrilled to go to sea. But, but, uh, but yes, Flip will go to sea again. Uh, he'll he'll be promoted. Uh, we'll look at that aspect uh, of his career as a as a junior flag officer, as a as a strike group commander. That that's my goal, and I think we'll go to an, another part of the world and explore it. Uh, uh, I, I like to do research on, on the, the Paul Mill headlines of the day, and there's certainly plenty out there today to, uh, to choose from. So uh, uh, it, it'll be uh, another year or two before Flip um, uh, get, gets, gets back to sea, but, but yes, he will. Boy, I, I, when I read Fight Fight, I was like, boy, you're prescient. This is <laughs> it was right from the headlines. Yeah, it was incredible. Same here. Well, thank you. So uh, just wrapping it up, I um, want to thank everyone for or coming here today and, and, and talking about the campaign and, and you know, everything that's come together. I think it's been a fantastic uh, initiative, and I can't thank uh, all of you enough for the participation and just overall, you know, you, you dream for a project where you have good people that come together and make it happen. And so... I'd be the first one to tell you that having an idea is, you know, it's a dime a dozen. That's probably overpriced, but um, getting the right people to come together and make and execute uh, that's phenomenal. And I think everybody uh, really brought it together. So thank you all for uh, bringing this together and making it happen. Thank you. I mean, speaking of good people, I forgot to mention too. So when you asked about who was involved, I'd like to do it, do them justice. Hey. So, yep. uh, so Highwayman Ed, who has been doing a lot of testing, but also helped me with um, upgrading some of the missions, so taking some of the work from me and doing it himself, it's, it's a huge help. And the other one is a ch- the Chicken, who's been doing um, especially one mission where we have a very heavy uh, cast scenario on, on, on one of the islands, and he basically wrote almost all of the parts for the uh, Special Forces guy that's talking to Flip, uh, and he has a lot of experience, a real life experience with that. So it's, it's, it was a top notch work and I'd like to thank him for that too. And also, of course, thank Kevin and Vincent for the opportunity to work together. As I said, it's been for, for a campaign designer for the DCS. It's a dream come true to be able to work with two <laughs> experienced aviators and, and it's good fun. I learned a lot and I hope we'll do something else together. Well, BD, oh, yeah. It's my pleasure to, to work with, with you and, and Jello and, and, and RG on this. Uh, it, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, I, I look I look forward to the to the next adventure. Um, also, uh, to, to, to the listeners here today, uh, for those of you that, that have read my novels, thank you very much. Thank thank you for your reviews and, and your support. It's uh, it, it certainly is uh, uh, motivating to me. To uh, I'll, I'll I'll keep at it. Like I mentioned, and uh, I just wa- I just do want to tell you uh, how much it means to me. Thank you. You know, if I can address that real quick, guys, uh, Hoser, really thank you because you are providing a service to people. I mean, you served in the cloth of our nation's military, and now you're serving in a different capacity where you're taking these experiences and, and turning them into the words that people can, in a sense, experience in their imaginations. And it's unlike anything else. It's not like Hollywood. It's not like what we talk about on the podcast. It's a different medium with a similar bent as far as helping people understand this world. And I think you do a good job with it. So please do keep at it. And you can count on us to help promote what you're doing and, and partner along with you. And Rob, to your point, as, as well as BD, I think uh, it's not my words, but I forget where I read it, that if you enjoy what you're doing, it's not work and people can't tell if you're, if you're working or playing or what you're doing. But this whole process for me was just so enjoyable because to be around people who can get the job done and have imagination and the ability to stick to schedules and, and, you know, not negotiate necessarily with each other, but just the give and take of, well, do we want it like this? Do we want it like that? It was just really pleasant. And so I hope that when this campaign comes out, that people will buy it. But more importantly, I hope they will enjoy it because this is just another way to immerse yourself in this world of naval aviation through hopefully something you already have with the supercarrier and the Hornet on DCS. And once you've enjoyed it for a while, well, tune back in because 
who knows what we might be working on next. <laughs> I think that's a perfect that's a perfect ending to this podcast. So thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate it. And, uh, we'll see you guys soon. Hold on, guys. Thanks for listening to Air Combat Sim. Don't forget to subscribe or tell a friend about it. You have a question, idea for an episode, or a special guest you'd like us to invite? Feel free to reach out on Facebook, Discord, or via email. Air Combat Sim was brought to you by BVR Productions. Oh, the, the, raven. Raven. the raven. The raven.